Senior Chancellor, uh, Senior Cardinal, uh, Ministros, uh, Secretario Mendes Marzano, meu português é tão ferrujado que vou falar em inglês. Há tradução simultânea em português e em espanhol. So, can we have the image of Amazon Hydrology on the screen, please? So, I want to spend about half my time explaining some more details of the hydrological cycle of the Amazon. Todos tienen, perdón, todos, todos tienen esto para la traducción simultánea. De manera que si no entienden inglés, pueden. Dos y tres, los canales dos y tres. Los canales dos y tres que están a la, a la mano derecha, donde dice el lenguaje. Ahí están los canales. Y el volumen está a mano izquierda en este, en este so pequeño. No necesito usarlo. Bueno. Okay, thank you. Bien, gracias. Sí, disculpa, disculpa, profesor. So if you click on that image, it should move. So until the mid-1970s, scientific dogma was that vegetation is simply the consequence of climate and has no influence on climate whatsoever. Until a Brazilian scientist, Enea Salati, analyzed ratios of isotopes of oxygen and rainwater from the Atlantic to the Peruvian border and demonstrated unequivocally that the Amazon makes half of its own rainfall. And that works fundamentally because when the moisture comes off the Atlantic, and falls is rain, about three quarters of that moisture is returned to the moving air mass through transpiration through the leaves and evaporation off the complex surfaces. And so it recycles five or six times until finally it reaches the high wall of the Andes, rises, cools, and releases the 20% of the world's river water which is the Amazon River system. We've learned a lot more about that hydrological cycle since that pioneering work. And as you can see from this image, which I will leave on the screen for the rest of my talk, that hydrological cycle actually contributes rain and moisture to every country in South America, with the exception of Chile. Chile is protected by the high wall of the Andes, which makes it a rain shadow. So it's a source of moisture for central Brazil, all the Amazon countries, and also Uruguay, Paraguay, and northern Argentina. So basically the challenge is how to manage this as a system. And it has been apparent from the very beginning of Salati's research uh, that there had to be some minimum amount of forest to support that hydrological cycle. And Brazilian climate scientists did some modeling about a dozen years ago to answer the question of how much deforestation might cause that cycle to erode. The conclusion was somewhere in the range of 40 or 50 percent. It seemed very distant. But what has happened in the ensuing years is there are additional factors pressing on, pressing on the hydrological cycle, climate change, and extensive use of fire. So Carlos Nobre and I uh, have concluded that 
hydrological cycle is actually very close to a tipping point. And what drives that tipping point more than anything else is the amount of deforestation in Brazil. Brazil would suffer the most if that tipping point actually occurred because there would be insufficient rain in the southern and eastern Amazon and maybe even parts of the central Amazon to actually support tropical rainforest. So there would be an immense ecological shift and a tremendous amount of carbon would go in the atmosphere, a tremendous amount of biological diversity would be lost, and all the other benefits that come from that hydrological cycle, including rainfall in central Brazil, would also diminish. Already, the dry season is longer and hotter uh, in the southern Amazon. So, so that is the same sustainability challenge going forward. What kinds of economic activities are compatible with maintaining that hydrological cycle? And Carlos and I believe that the periodic historic droughts that now happen about every five years are signals that the tipping point is flickering. The good news in all of this is that defore reforestation can build back that margin of safety. And roughly 20 to 23% of the defore deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon actually is degraded forest in the beginning stages of recovery. It's perfectly possible to encourage all of that uh, and build back this margin of safety and, in a sense, guarantee sustainability into the future uh, for the hydrological cycle in all the countries of the Amazon. What this is going to require, of course, is some new vision, some of which we've already heard bits of this morning new vision of ways to think about infrastructure, think about sustainable infrastructure, because so much of the past infrastructure uh, basically really wouldn't withstand the test of any proper economic analysis, as rarely has maintenance been factored into uh, the calculations. But if we think about sustainable infrastructure, it will include a greater emphasis, as we're seeing actually in the Peruvian Amazon, on going back to the original source of transportation, namely the river systems. And perhaps there are ways to build infrastructure like the gasoducto in, in the state of Amazonas, uh, which set up in a way that prohibits any side roads. So there is no deforestation associated with that bit of infrastructure. So it's, it's not a question of infrastructure or not. It's in the details and the way we think about it and how we learn from experiments going forward. And most people, when they think about infrastructure, think first and foremost about transportation. But of course, energy is another big piece of the infrastructure challenge. And basically, the Amazon river systems are really important in terms of sediment flows from the Andes, which underpin the floodplain agriculture system of the Amazon, and are also incredibly important for migratory fish, uh, which have life cycles which range from the estuary all the way to the headwaters and back. Very important sources of animal protein for all those communities. And it is perfectly possible, and there are examples of building hydroelectric uh, facilities, which are called run of river, and allow for some passage of sediments and migratory fish. But then there is the larger question of what other kinds of economic activity 
could be useful in the Amazon. And some of it comes from the incredible biological resources themselves. We all know about the wonderful freshwater fish in the Amazon. Uh, and they are quite actually susceptible to development in aquaculture. State of Acre recently had a 5% increase in its state annual economic product just because of increase in aquaculture. And Governor Wilson, Luna, and I were talking last week about a time when these Amazon fish species could become as well known as salmon and tuna and swordfish and dover sole around the world. Uh, but there also is a wealth of potential in all that biological diversity which just has yet to be explored. And one needs to stop for a minute and realize that every species every day is exploring new solutions to biological challenges in its existence. And any one of those at any time can literally transform the life sciences. So I'm willing to bet that a third to a half of the people in this room depend, like I do, on ACE inhibitors to control uh, my hypertension. That actually is based on how the venom of a poisonous snake from the Amazon forest actually works. And hundreds of millions of people around the world live longer, healthier, and more productive lives because of that science. So one of the important ways going forward is to actually have a programmatic approach to exploring that potential and to do it in association with industry because only industry can bring one of those wonderful new potentials to actual success. And this is a vision that's not unique to me. Carlos Nobre talked about it. It's arisen in various forms over the years, but I think it's time for all the Amazon countries together to think about how to pursue that uh, incredible potential. And I went with uh, Brazilian ambassador to the US, Paulo Tarso Fletcher de Lima, to visit the Pfizer research laboratories about 15 years ago. It was a $3 billion a year research program trying to identify four or five things that 15 years in the future will be their major profit source. And the head of that research facility said he thought if you could apply an ecological screen to natural products, you would have a higher success rate in identifying potential new pharmaceuticals than any other existing approach. And an example of that would be to study which trees the leaf cutting ants do not take leaves from. Because what they're actually doing is they're taking leaves and they can defoliate a tree overnight. They're taking the pieces of leaves down underground to grow fungus and that's what they live on. So automatically you can tell that those ants are not going to be taking leaves that have natural fungicides in them. So that would immediately give you uh, a clue as to important new fungicides that could be useful in medicine, uh, could be useful in agriculture, and all the various biologically based activities that humanity engages in. And lastly, let's think about cities. What, what would constitute a sustainable city in the Amazon? And I, for one, have 
always said there will be no sustainable future for the Amazon until there's a high, reasonable quality of life uh, in sustainable cities. And that's where some of the biggest challenge lies going ahead. Not every city can depend on the economic free zone that Manaus benefits from and which all the forest of Amazonas benefits from. But it's very interesting if you look at the kinds of economic activity that have gone on in Manaus. Uh, it's mostly industrial assembly using materials that don't come out of the forest. So that's part of the reason that Amazonas has this increasing economic product and a decreasing deforestation rate. Uh, that's not the long-term solution. We need to always be exploring new forms of sustainability. Uh, but it gives us an indication that, yes, indeed, there can be a sustainable quality of life in cities. And we need to think, too, about the quality of life in communities outside of the cities. And there, the kind of example we saw uh, in Virgilio Viana's presentation uh, at the very outset this morning uh, of the Rio de uh, Negro Sustainable Development Reserve with good health care, good education, connected by broadband to the city of Manaus, uh, you have a very successful quality of life in that community, very sustainable. And what I find the most fascinating about it all, even though they're connected by broadband to the rest of the world, there is little interest in the younger generation in that community in actually going to the bright lights of the big cities. Um, so what I'm hoping to convey to you, yes, the Amazon needs to be managed as a system. Uh, yes, there are plenty of things going on today which uh, are not particularly sustainable, but you are sitting on the biological treasure trove of the planet. It's a lot of carbon, of course, which is why people talk about it in climate change. But to value the Amazon for its carbon is like to value a computer chip for its silicon. And I think we are quite capable uh, through enlightened government and concerted science to realize that sustainable future. Thank you.